So today we're going to talk about cities and urban sociology and um, an important aspect of our world, which is its enormous urbanization. And in this conversation, um, I'm going to draw upon something I said in one of the earlier lectures about the massive demographic increase that's happened in um, the world and how that demographic increase is really restructuring social life. But it's not just that we have this demographic increase that's restructuring social life because there are more people. It's that there are more people living in different ways than they lived before. And today, we'll talk about some of that. And in particular, we'll talk about how people now live together in cities. Um, and actually, we'll talk about how they live together, not just in cities, but in megacities, in these massive, massive places with tens of millions of people collected together. And this is of deep interest to sociologists because it's a different way of living than for most of human history. Um, within these um, massive urban places, uh, there are all kinds of opportunities and there are also all kinds of social problems. Um, uh, we shouldn't think of urbanization as better or worse than um, previous uh, kinds of societies, but just fundamentally different in really profound ways and that require our attention. It's important to note that this process is not over. Um, it's not that there was a massive demographic growth and then people started to move to the cities. Instead, we're very much in the middle of this and in places um, uh, like in China, throughout many areas of Africa and Latin America, through um, um, areas of Asia, this process is, is perhaps the most dramatic social process um, that's happening. So particularly in China, the urban-rural divide, the distinction between rural and urban areas is really the most important social distinction within that space. And um, it is, this is one of the primary drivers of lots of social transformations, people moving from the countryside into the city. Um, and so, you know, the, the, we should not also have a romantic notion that there were no cities before, that there were, you know, um, just farming communities and eventually somehow there were cities. Cities have always been part of human communities. Um, uh, uh, research from archaeologists often shows that, that the rural areas emerged around cities, um, not vice versa. Um, but uh, for now, we're just going to think about what's happening in our urban world and how it is that we have, have experienced and what the consequences are this massive process of urbanization. So for the first time in human history, more than half of the world's population lives in urban areas. Um, and this is sort of urban areas broadly conceived. It doesn't mean that half the world is living in a place like where I live in Manhattan. Um, I'm not there right now. I'm actually um, trying to visit my parents. Uh, so um, I'm somewhere else in this moment. But uh, still, for the first time in, in recorded human history, half of the world's population is living inside of the city. And um, uh, this is this includes things like some of the urban, I mean, suburban areas around cities. So um, uh, if we look at this picture of Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil, we see that some of the areas in, in, in this urban space are densely clustered um, uh, tall buildings and others have little green spaces between them, et cetera. And so uh, cities are diverse places in terms of their structure and their spatial dynamics. And as we've said before, one of the reasons that cities matter is because space matters. Um, uh, where people live and how they live surrounded by other people matters for their social life. And so one of the major structuring forces of our activity are the spatial dynamics within which um, uh, we live. So if you live, uh, for example, in one of these high towers in Sao Paulo, Brazil, that creates spatial opportunities and spatial constraints. Um, and that will be a little bit different than if you live in one of those lower rise areas. And you know, different kinds of people are going to emerge and act and interact within those different kinds of spaces. This is part of the reason why urban 
uh, transformations are so important because there are new kinds of spaces that are beginning to emerge. It also points to, however, the capacity or opportunity for us to redesign urban space in ways that might promote the kinds of socialization that we think of as beneficial and to constrain the kinds that we are concerned about. You may think about the projects, this idea of projects in American cities. Um, often such projects look a little bit like the, you know, uh, the white buildings in Sao Paulo that we see here of tall um, uh, buildings. And imagine just what, it, you know, how they, they are often associated with um, problems of urban life. But you should know that the projects and um, housing projects of that kind were built with urban design in mind. They were built in the hope of getting rid of the slum. And the idea was that through these kinds of projects, we could do a few things. Instead of having people spread out over a space, we could put them vertically, creating more public space, more spaces between people so that there weren't dark alleys and, and so that like there was actually a space for children to play, for people to meet on the street, et cetera. One of the ideas of building these big projects was that if you lived in these kinds of buildings, you were going to get light into your apartment and that that would be kind of nice because, you know, if you're living in a low rise slum, if you're living in an area that has basically lots of small buildings that are densely tacked, packed together, um, chances are you will never see light in the way that you would if you lived in a tower. And so it was thought, well, you people would get towers and views and the, the little light would be something shining upon them that they would like. I personally would like that. I like having light into my apartment. And so, you know, the idea of these spaces was one actually built in a concept of social reform. And uh, we are constantly trying to think about how to redesign urban spaces and our physical spaces in general in order to promote positive social interactions. Um, as this is happening, we, the, the, the uh, need to do so, to build new spaces, is accelerating enormously. So just take a look for a moment at the megacities. Um, and this would be cities in uh, 2016 that have, in their broader metro area, nearly 20 million people. and um, uh, uh, what you'll see is that there are um, spaces like Tokyo with nearly 40 million people in it, Delhi with 26 million, Shanghai with 25 million, Mumbai with 21 million. These are massive, massive urban spaces. But if you also look to what those urban spaces were like in the 1990s, we'll see something quite dramatic. Though Japan, Mexico, so Tokyo, Japan, Mexico City, um, Osaka and New York haven't really grown that much. Um, so New York has grown from 60 million to 18 and a half million. So it's, it's, a, it's a growth, but it's not a massive growth. Other spaces have grown enormously. Look at Shanghai, for example. It's gone from just under 8 million to over 24 million. It's three times the size that it was within 16 years. That is an enormous, enormous transformation. And the number of megacities, that is the number of cities with at least 10 million inhabitants has grown enormously. So in 1990, there were only 10 megacities in the world. Um, and in 2016, there are 31 of them. Um, and so it's not just that we have more cities, it's that we have a particular kind of city, a new set of um, cities uh, called, which, which um, I'll call just, or the scholars call megacities, massive, massive places um, uh, where um, tens of millions of people live. Oh, excuse me. Um, I'm not sure why my um, video, there we are. Uh, sorry about that. Still working through some of the technology of all of this. Uh, giving these lectures online. Um, so, uh, you know, th the idea here is, is not, is that actually the cities that uh, um, we're pointing to 
uh, are growing in size. There are more of them, and there are more very, very large cities. Um, cities with soon, you know, there's probably by today more than um, 10 um, um, cities that have more than 20 million people. And so um, this massive growth uh, has been really accelerated within the developing world. Um, so looking at something like a place like Cairo, or the experience of Beijing, Shanghai, Sao Paulo, Mumbai, um, uh, Delhi. Um, these are huge transformations in those spaces, um, leading to a range of both social problems and, as I said before, social opportunities, but also requiring huge, huge public works interventions, new roads, new sewage systems, new buildings, and new kinds of infrastructure, and new jobs that would uh, be, that are different than the kinds of jobs that people did before, and having to have a newly trained population capable of doing those jobs. These mega cities actually exist within what we call mega regions. So um, this is a picture of the United States and you can see along the eastern seaboard here a mega region stretching from Boston um, which is just up uh, in the upper right hand corner down through DC. So clusters of cities are now increasingly linked together by geographic proximity called mega regions, which, which have shared economic activities. Um, so uh, we can also see uh, the, mega gro the growth of mega cities around San Francisco and San Jose being there and um, this new emerging set of connections or um, uh, Los Angeles down to San Diego um, and that these cities are beginning to blend in to one another and um, that they're being tied to one another through migration, through commuting, and through the coordination of economic activities. So the connections tend to be incredibly strong within mega regions. Um, uh, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, uh, uh, Baltimore, Washington, DC are deeply integrated together in terms of their economies um, uh, and uh, uh, their uh, um, sort of, in some ways, even their social life. And it's not just that cities uh, close to one another are deeply connected to each other. It's also that uh, we tend to have what we refer to as global cities, cities that are deeply connected with other cities around the world and often look somewhat similar to them. If you've been fortunate enough to travel to cities around the world, one of the things that you may have noticed um, is that some districts, some areas look very similar in different cities. What does that mean? Well, it kind of means like, you know, the, the elites in, the, in cities basically shop in the same kinds of shops no matter what cities they're in. And so if you walk down um, uh, Fifth Avenue in, um, in New York City or, um, you know, uh, the Champs-Élysées in Paris, um, uh, or, uh, um, you know, uh, the critical district in, in Seoul, Korea, um, you'll often see the same kinds of shops. And uh, these connections among global cities in different parts of the world serve as hubs of international commerce and international conversation where people from different parts of the world are engaging in similar kinds of activities as ways to sort of constitute what we might think of as a global elite or um, a, a global elite citizenry. They're buying the same clothes and watches. Um, they're engaging in consumption, practice, consumption practices that are sensible to people in other parts of the world. This is not a totally new phenomenon. And in fact, the connection between global cities, cities in the world, um, is a long running connection. I like to tell the story of um, uh, Eric Hobsbawm, who was a historian uh, in England um, uh, through the 20th century. And he has a great set of introductory books of history just to introduce you to um, what happened in primarily Europe, but around the world over um, from basically the 1600s until today. And he tells this story about the French Revolution. The French Revolution was in 1789. Um, and the French Revolution is somewhat misnamed because it's not really the French Revolution, it's kind of the Parisian Revolution. Um, 
Uh, and what I mean by that, and what some historians, some historians would get mad at me for saying that, but um, uh, some of them would, would kind of agree, was that the, the revolution happened within Paris and its surrounding regions. And for the rest of France, it wasn't, um, uh, uh, it was notable um, and, and consequential, but the story kind of evokes how different other areas of France were. So Hobsbawm tells this story that during the French Revolution, or immediately after the French Revolution, he, he says the world was both very small and very big. And he notes that it only took a matter of hours for news of the French Revolution to reach London. So for news to travel north from Paris, across the channel, into England, and then up to London. And I think it was something like 36 hours. So it wasn't a terribly long period of time before word of the revolution reached this other major city, not far away from Paris, but across an ocean in, 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 um, in a different land. So 36 hours is pretty quick in 1789. Um, but Hobsbawm notes that um, there was a town outside of Paris, um, maybe 90 miles away, um, so much closer to the actual revolution and in the same country, um, that didn't hear about the French Revolution for weeks. Now, this is, is astonishing, like the, the fact that um, this small town wouldn't have heard about a revolution in its own country um, for weeks, um, much less than it heard far after some of the megacities of the world, or some of the, the London wasn't a megacity at the time, but it was probably had about a million people, but other major cities. And it points to how it is that cities have often or long been connected to one another, that cities are tied to one another in their economic, political um, uh, dynamics, as well as their imagination who they are and who they're in conversation with. In this sense, you could say that, that, that you know, um, parts of the experience of living in New York connect New Yorkers more deeply with residents of Shanghai or Seoul um, uh, or Mumbai uh, or Rome um, or Sao Paulo than they do rural residents of Wyoming. Um, uh, and this is part of the idea of a global city is that the economic um, connections as well as the imagination of what it is to be a human may tie cities together in distinct ways that sort of transcend um, the experience of living in a nation. Um, now, as we look to this growth of cities, the enormous growth of mega cities and the transformation of, of, of cities into mega regions, we ask as sociologists, what's happening to community life? So what are the consequences for community and for our connections with others as we enter into these spaces to move to a place like Shanghai from a village where the village may have 200 people and the city has 25, 30 million people is a profound transformation in your life. Um, but more generally, um, uh, um, uh, even for people who have less profound transformations, um, the growth of cities has changed human interactions. And those changes in human interactions require some investigation, some questioning of um, uh, uh, what it means now that we are connected to one another um, through uh, these spaces that are densely inhabited by other people and in spaces where very few of us do any of the work required to sustain the broader community. In fact, we typically rely upon people not in cities to do some of that work, like, for example, grow our food. In rural villages, people know each other intimately. Um, in urban areas, they often interact in transitory ways. And sociologists like um, Georg Zimmel, uh, Tonys, and, and, and Worth all worried about how it was that the rise of a city would erode community life. In an earlier lecture on Durkheim, um, I spoke about how Durkheim saw this transformation from organic, um, excuse me, from mechanical to organic solidarity. This transformation from societies 
um, where every person was connected to every other person, to societies that were more organic. And so, as you may recall, the example I gave, an example I gave was my watch. And to say that if we were to remove a gear of my watch as a mechanism, the watch wouldn't really work. But that every part in the watch is tied to every other part in the watch. And that that's less the case within my physical body. Um, that if we were to remove um, some parts, even small part of my physical body in general, I would be perfectly fine. Um, and this is a, a discussion from Durkheim of a transformation of solidarity, but really a transformation in urbanization. So the rise of urbanization, the rise of urban spaces, and how that rise of urban spaces is fundamentally transforming how we are connected with one another, how we are connected to other people. And so where in rural spaces, people were um, uh, knew each other intimately. Um, so if you knew somebody and they knew somebody, you knew the somebody that they knew. So um, two people know each other and that one of those people knows a third person, that third person is known by everyone in the group as well. Um, and, and, you know, as the example from the slide suggests, like, you know, that a person who delivers your mail might live very close to you um, uh, and in, the, in a city, but you don't really know that person in a meaningful way other than as your mail person. Um, uh, you don't quite know them as a complete human being with loved ones, emotional challenges, good and bad habits, etc. So, you know, if you live in a small urban village, like the rural village in Germany here that we see before you, um, you have maybe a butcher, for example, that you buy meat from, but you know your butcher as a human being as well. Chances are the butcher's children go to school with, with your children, and the butcher goes to church with you, and you know when family members of the butcher dies, and you know... Um, you know, if the butcher maybe likes to drink a little bit too much in the bar or the pub, and you know a lot about that butcher. Um, whereas in the city, you may go to a butcher or a grocery store and meet a clerk, and you probably don't know that person, and you're probably never going to know that person. Um, cities, interestingly enough, even though they're densely populated, provide for the capacity of anonymity in a way that rural spaces don't. And the earlier sociologists like Zimmel, Tonys, Wirth, um, all were concerned about this because you know most of our human existence had been spent in spaces like these smaller rural villages rather than major cities. And so the question was, how is it that we can connect to other people if um, we all can potentially live a deeply anonymous life? How are we going to be capable of um, creating meaningful social ties if most of our interactions are transitory? If most of the people we encounter, we don't really develop relationships with, we don't really know anything about them. Because that means that nobody really develops relationships with us, that we don't really, we aren't really known by others. Durkheim, of course, uh, as, well, I shouldn't say of course, Durkheim, as I, as I suggested in an earlier lecture, um, said, well, you know, one of the solutions to this is to create um, uh, mechanical systems within organic societies. So within a city or within these new organic societies to have places where people are deeply connected to one another, to kind of find your place, um, uh, uh, to have maybe a subculture within a city that you personally um, deeply belong to. Um, you know, increasingly, um, sociologists are sort of pushing back at the idea that city life is somehow empty or doesn't allow us to connect with other people. Um, Claude Fisher, the sociologist, has argued that cities simply generate new forms of community like subcultures. It's not like people in cities exist in this total loneliness. I use that phrase, total loneliness, because sociologists in the 50s wrote these um, pieces talking about um, the very evocative book, for example, called The Lonely Crowd. And the idea, the beautiful kind of idea that's evoked there is that people are living in crowds in cities and they're all lonely while being surrounded by other 
And this has long been the fear of cities. But recent research has pointed to the fact that this is probably untrue. Um, so a group of demographers noted that, you know, there are lots of people who live alone these days, who are single and live by themselves, but that those people tend to have more rather than fewer social connections to people than people who live in familial units. Um, Eric Kleinenberg, the urban sociologist, has referred to these people as singletons and notes how people living alone, people who are single, are more engaged in collective community. In part because, you know, um, if you have a family and you work and you come home to your family, um, you know, you, you, you have less of an opportunity to, to develop robust social connections. But it's helped push back against the idea of loneliness in a crowd or um, um, uh, 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 the idea that people in cities are somehow further and further removed from one another and feeling these, this depth of loneliness. Other digital sociologists, people who look at online communities, have noted that networks in school, work, and online define our communities as much as residential neighborhoods, and that these online communities can lead to connections with others um, in dynamic ways. So the picture here is of someone, you know, alone on a beach, but looking down at their cell phone, and you likely have seen or participated in something like this many times before yourself. And what it represents is a person who is connected with other people through digital means. So that the lack of in-person connection, if you live in a city, maybe you don't see someone for a week or two because it's such a vast space and it, you're unlikely to serendipitously run into them, doesn't um, remove the possibility of connecting with others. You know, the emergence of subcultures that uh, Fisher talks about are very important to cities. And often people actually seek out cities in order to participate in sub subcultures, to have connections that they couldn't otherwise have. Think, for example, of, say, the LGBTQ community and how often um, uh, gay people move to cities. Why? Well, because there's a critical mass of other gay people in the cities, that there's a capacity to interact with one another to find one another. This is important for sexual partnerships, but it's also important just for a sense of community, a sense of being tied to other people. And so, you know, cities may facilitate, um, they may make possible an interaction, a human interaction for some groups of people that wouldn't be possible in rural areas. Um, uh, um, and, uh, uh, Wellman and others have suggested that networks have liberated us from um, um, being constrained by distance to create community. Um, uh, that we communicate with all kinds of people through all kinds of media, and so physical proximity may not matter as much as it used to. Um, you know, you can you can ask yourself like, do you even know your neighbors? Like, do you know the people who live in apartments in the same building that you live in? or uh, people who live on your floor or people who live around you, you might not, um, or you even might ask yourself, like, maybe you've been listening to a bunch of lectures given by me, like, you have no idea who I am, um, really, but we're developing some kind of connection through this medium of communication, through this type technology that allows us to connect with one another.